Christine Hastorf, the Director of the Archaeological Research Facility, and I want to invite, uh, welcome and invite you all here. Um, this is our spring lecture. We have two lectures a year, one in the fall and one in the spring, where we try and bring a distinguished scholar in to speak uh, to us and share uh, their cogent information. And today's lecture, as you will see and hear very soon, um, is about the greater Near East. And so I wanted to also mention right at the beginning, which you saw in the posters, that this is co-sponsored by the Near Eastern Studies Department here on campus and also the Bade Museum of Biblical Archaeology, GTU. But before we turn uh, to today's lecture, I want to remind people of the series of workshops on equipment and methods that we do here at the Archaeological Research Facility, beginning with tomorrow's event, which is also posted up outside of 3D laser scanning, imaging, and virtual reality for cultural heritage and archaeology. That's one to three, and that's going to be right in this room with all kinds of mod cons and trying it out yourself, right? Um, with a team of people, including Ruth Traylon. No, no, I'm no. You're my, not? My surrogate. Your surrogate. Okay, well, in spirit, Ruth will be here. And um, also, I hope you don't mind, but I thought for those of you who want to hear about our workshops and programs and regular weekly lectures, we're going to pass this uh, sheet where you can sign up if you were here today. And if you want to receive anything, put your email down. And we will put you on the list, and you will receive information as we go along. You can sign later if you want. <laughs> so if you want to start that, thank you. OK. so. Um, we at ARF and I especially am pleased to have uh, Dr. Professor uh, Jason Orr here for our spring lecture. He is a professor in the Anthropology Department at Harvard University and is also the director of the Center for Geographic Analysis there, linking nicely with this week's series of workshops and presentations on Berkeley, and including the workshop tomorrow. Dr. Orr has been active archaeologist since 1993 receiving his BA from the University of Pennsylvania and PhD from the University of Chicago, where he has completed research across the greater Western Asia. And here we go. From a CV, Yemen, Egypt, correct me if I'm wrong, Jordan, Turkey, Syria, Iran, and Iraq. And there's probably some I'm missing. So I think it's safe to say from all over. Uh, primarily completing a survey, completing a lot of um, geographical information, and also excavation. So the, uh, the full spectrum of scholarship. Since 2012, he has directed the Herbville Plain Archaeological Survey, EPAS, which isn't up there, but I'm guessing <laughs> we're going to hear about it. You're going to hear about it. <laughs> uh, located in the Ur Herbville Governorate in Kurdistan region of Iraq. And uh, we're all, I'm especially looking forward to that. He is published regularly on his fieldwork with a special focus on early urbanism, illustrated in his 2010 book, Urbanism and Cultural Landscapes in Northeastern Syria, the Tel Hamur Hamurkar survey. And I'm guessing he's not even going back there now, so <laughs> it's really good to have that data and a current manuscript, another manuscript, more on his broader interest, that is the evolution of Mesopotamian cities. So those of us who have an interest in the rise of urbanism and uh, the engagement of uh, rural and urban, this is going to be a special treat for us today. It's thought and written about the role also of households, that is the small scale in these urban, urban settings, in the developing urbanism, illustrated in a series of, of publications. To name a few, he's published in the Near Eastern Archaeology, Norwegian Archaeological Review, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Paleo Orient, Zubartu, Journal of Iranian Archaeology, Journal of Archaeological Research, Iraq, Antiquity, and Akkadia, and more, but those are the only ones I've written down. But I do want to highlight just one article that I uh, found particularly engaging that was published in the Cambridge Archaeological in the Cambridge Archaeological Journal that illustrates a reassessment of the place of households and lineages in these early urban settings. He proposes a new model for urbanism in that region and places households and the growth of lineages and households in the central 
location as opposed to being altered and peripheral by the top-down models that we're so used to reading about from that region. So in that respect, he's proposing a family or household structure extending out across all aspects of communication and production, building on local, long-lived, indigenous historical models of communication and production, uh, forming out of his uh, use of the house society model. Households were durable, long-lived, productive units there, and I'm assuming continue to be so today in the region. He calls them public households, some of these groups that ended up communities that well, you're sitting here. <laughs> Sit right there. There you go. Um, public households. Um, they seem particularly stable, thank you very much. Um, placing kinship and lineage relations at the center of political development, urbanism, and political hierarchy which I think is an interesting thing to think about for us even today in our world. So I'm not going to say anything more. I'm going to let him do the talking, and we're going to turn to his landscape-oriented research, at least to begin with, as you can see from the photo behind me. And I hope you'll appreciate and welcome uh, Dr. Jason Ur to Arf with his The Imperial Landscape the Imperial Landscape of Syria from the ground and above. So, welcome. I just want to point out a couple more seats in here. Would you like to come in? Okay. Hey, thanks. Well, Christine, thank you and, uh, and the ARF for inviting me to speak here. Um, I, I always get a little bit embarrassed by these introductions, but I, I love this one in particular because, to my knowledge, you're the first person that's read my Cambridge Archaeological Journal article. And, <laughs> and you gave enough of a description beyond the abstract that I believe that you actually read it. Yes, I did. <laughs> OK. Um, so it's a thrill to be here. Uh, I haven't been in this part of the Bay Area in, I think, about 28 years. I went to high school in San Ramon, which I think is somewhere over there on the other side of the hills. And all of the smart kids from my high school went to Berkeley, and I got a second semester admission, and I didn't end up coming here. So this is where I was supposed to be 28 years ago, um, but I didn't quite make it until now. So this is, this is kind of a, a, an honor to, to be here. Uh, I am also happy to be here talking about um, ancient Assyria. I wondered if the esteemed Professor Stronach, whether I would see him, um, and he is in fact here. So I'm coming, to, um, I'm coming to speak about Assyria in a place that I associate with some of the best research on ancient Assyria, but from a radically different perspective and a radically different scale. So I, um, you know, as Christine mentioned, I'm interested in uh, in the past from a landscape perspective. I'm interested in questions that you, you can't really answer by digging a hole in the ground, no matter how big that hole is. And this has caused me to realize that I can't answer these questions on the ground. There are just some things that are, some phenomena that are too big really to be approached with your feet pegged to the ground. You have to go up. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I've uh, addressed a, a particularly interesting question on the, the structure of, a, of imperial landscapes. Um, especially using methods that involve kind of a remote uh, perspective. So uh, uh, briefly, in terms of the way I approach my uh, questions, I'm really interested in how landscapes came to have, have their structure, how, um, how social forces, environmental forces might have encouraged particular directions of development. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe dissuaded other particular adaptations, and, and how we as archaeologists can kind of approach this, especially when we're dealing with landscapes that have um, been occupied for a long time. If I'm interested in early Bronze Age landscapes, that's great, but I do have to deal with the Iron Age and the Classical period, and in this part of the world, the Islamic period, and there's, there's, there's nothing short of a time machine that allows me to not pay attention to all of these different uh, subsequent historical phases, which can really cause, uh, really make for some, for some challenges. Uh, I found it useful to kind of approach landscapes from two different perspectives, uh, emergent and imposed, which you can also think of as uh, kind of bottom-up or top-down. 
Uh, I think a lot of my colleagues in the ancient Near East, we tend to think from a top-down perspective. Perhaps we're a little over-influenced by um, the royal inscriptions or the legend of Gilgamesh, the great builder of Uruk. We tend to think of cities and even landscapes as being, as taking their structure kind of from the perspective of grand planners, powerful kings that could cause landscapes to take a particular shape. Um, and you know, a, mod a good modern analogy is, is this is Hamadan in western Iran where a perfectly organic city had a lovely kind of Haussmann-esque Parisian um, set of boulevards blasted through it. This is a, a clear case where one or a couple of designers decided that this particular landscape was going to have this form and they had the power to make this happen. My colleagues see this a lot. I have a tendency, I, I have strongly suspected that most of what we're seeing is, very, is largely emergent. It can be highly structured, like something like Hamadan, but it doesn't require sort of a central planner, a, a intelligent designer, is another way of, of putting it, for a landscape to get this form. And, and I've given you here a photo of, a, of a, a marsh village in the south of Iraq, where I think if you look, you can see structure. You can see uh, you can see buildings that all are more or less oriented in the same way. They're evenly spaced. They sit on reclaimed land in the marshes that's roughly the same size. But nobody told them that you know, your building has to be oriented this way or you have to be X meters from your neighbors. This is an emergent property of commonly held ideas about the proper way to build a house, be connected to your neighbor or not connected to your neighbor that without anybody telling you, kind of emerges to create a, a very structured form, in this case, the, the, the Marsh Village. Now, you can put these on opposite ends of a continuum from you know, hyper-designed, and I'm a big fan of the Eisenhower um, interstate highway system for that reason, to emergent, very, very complete, uh, terrace landscapes in Yemen is a good example. You can put those on a, on a, on a continuum of course, no landscape that we're going to be able to find is really going to be one or the other. Everything kind of exists as a combination of imposed structures and, 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 and emergent. But this is an interesting question to, to try to, to tease out. To what extent were, were um, individuals responsible for their landscape or um, was it large planners? The ancient Near East, the, the Middle East general, is a great place to ask these sorts of questions for a handful of reasons. For one, um, the sites. Can anybody not see the archaeological site in that picture? Highly obtrusive, really easy to find um, on the ground and especially from space, um, uh, also with high visibility uh, of artifacts, um, in a landscape that's been deforested for you know, since the start of the, of the, the Neolithic. So landscape archaeology is, is easy here. Um, also, uh, early uh, social complexity social complexity shows up really early, so there's been a long time for landscapes to take interesting forms to be studied. And um, the Middle East has been historically underdeveloped, and this really has continued right up to the end of the 21st century, still continues for large parts of the Middle East. So I can ask questions of my landscapes in the Middle East that would be impossible to answer in, for example, Europe or North America, where 20th century urbanization and development has just overwhelmed the kind of fragile elements of landscape that I would love, that I would love to study. So after um, my early career of studying uh, early cities, as Christine mentioned, that, that I ultimately concluded were largely um, bottom-up, emergent products of individuals despite the boasts of early royal inscriptions. I have decided in the last five years that I want to really look closely at the other end of that spectrum. I want to see if, if there really are such a thing as early imposed landscapes. And if anything could do this, it would be um, imperial political constellations. So I've turned to the Assyrian uh, Empire um, as, a, as, a good, as a good test case uh, to do this. Let me say a little bit, uh, I know there's some experts on Assyria in this room and there may be some of you who have no idea what I'm talking about with Assyria, so a little bit of background here. Um, in the, the, starting at the beginning of the first millennium BC, uh, the Assyrian state, which had been kind of concentrated in this northern part of Iraq here, it expanded out and ultimately by uh, here at 720, at one of the real heights of the empire, it encompassed 
almost all of the modern Republic of Iraq, large parts of Western Iran, big, big parts of Syria and southeastern Turkey, and extending down into the Levant. In some places it went beyond this, never for, for very long, but um, certainly the largest political entity that had existed up, in, up until that time, centered on uh, the homeland in the, the northern part of Iraq. Uh, a series of capital cities along the uh, Tigris River, starting at Ashur, the ancestral and religious capital from which we get Assyria, um, and slowly, uh, it, with time, moving the capital up the Tigris. So the capital then moved to Kalhu, which you may know as uh, Nimrud, uh, Khorsabad Dur Sharokin, and ultimately to its, its, its ultimate location at, at Nineveh. Um, Nineveh uh, being uh, the royal foundation of one of the great biblical bad guys, um, Sennacherib, probably a guy who deserved this reputation. Um, but this, ha this area is generally referred to as the Assyrian Triangle because it includes uh, the city of Erbil, the modern and ancient city of Erbil, off to one side, giving it a kind of a triangular uh, shape. And this is really the historical core of the, the Assyrian Empire. So uh, in starting this project, I had an idea that I might be looking at a very structured landscape of some kind of elements that caused me to believe that this might be the case. So uh, for one, we have unbelievably uh, large planned um, capital cities um, from starting from the beginning, but culminating, as I mentioned, in the great city of, of Nineveh right here, where you can see the, um, the, the citadel area, but a vast, <coughs> walled area encompassing about 750 hectares. This was the largest city on the planet at the time um, and clearly very en engineered. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, the place from which a lot of the famous Assyrian reliefs that you'll see in the British Museum uh, come from. Uh, very strong focus on the elite aspects of the city by early archaeologists. Um, Professor Stronach was poised to break that monopoly of the elite on archaeological research by doing um, some work, uh, especially here and at, at Gates on the southern end of the city. One of the real, one of the many tragedies of the, uh, uh, the first Gulf War was the cessation of this project, which was really sh poised to finally give us some understanding of the way the structure of a, a city worked. Um, so cities. Also hydrology, nearly the entire landscape behind the city of Nineveh had been uh, transformed by canals, dams, and even, even aqueducts. This is the aqueduct at, at Jerwan. Um, so that water was redirected most often in the direction, you know, from these hills back here and in the direction uh, of Nineveh. There is evidence that, the dem that there was a demographic transition in this landscape as well. Uh, surveys in an adjacent region have shown an unbelievably even scatter of villages across the landscape, um, almost like somebody had deliberately decided that we were going to put even small villages fully across the landscape, a very, very artificial pattern of settlement. I'll come back to what this rural colonization might mean in, in, in just a moment. And then there's good evidence that there was a uh, kind of an ideological stamp placed on this. Throughout this landscape, there were monuments showing uh, the kings being handed the uh, divine symbols of legitimacy uh, that anybody that saw this would, would know that uh, the king was legitimate. And, this, and this, these things were tied together. So this rock relief shown here with the great archaeologist uh, Austin Henry Layard being lowered down onto it, this, this sat at this point right here at the head of uh, a dam which took water about 95 kilometers from the mountains on the fringes of Assyria to the capital city at, at Nineveh. So really all tied together, this suggests that there was possibly a really strong design for what the Assyrian landscape should look like, exactly the kind of top-down uh, landscape that I proposed to, to study. But back to, that, back to that demographic engineering element of this. Uh, this might show up in the Bible. There are passages in the historical books that talk about how the Assyrian kings not only conquered biblical lands, but took its population away and took it back to Assyria. If you're a biblical person, you may probably associate this with Nebuchadnezzar and other later kings as well, but the Assyrians got a good head start on this. And it even shows up in the, 
in the palaces. You're looking here at a relief from the palace of uh, Sennacherib in, in Nineveh showing um, the Assyrian army leading away these deportees. And here's, here's a man kind of going, being led off with his wife and children on a, a chariot with their belongings, being taken away to, to exile back to Assyria. And the Assyrian kings also make very similar claims. It's a bit odd for the victims and the victors to largely tell the same story, but you get that here where you have royal inscriptions, in this case of Sennacherib himself, uh, describing conquest and then talking about taking away 200,150 people and their animals and possessions and moving them back to, uh, back to Assyria. So there's a lot of evidence for the possibility that there could be this, this very, very deliberate uh, demographic engineering in the core. But I have, um, I have a, a kind of an attitude towards royal inscriptions and how they should be treated as historical sources. I mean, the Bible has problems as well, but royal inscriptions, they tell us far more about what people at the time were intended to think about their worlds than uh, some historical document that they or we, 3,000 years later, could take as, uh, as actual fact. So here's where I felt that a landscape archaeology project could kind of come to bear to evaluate these claims that we see in, in the royal inscriptions. So that's what took me here. Now this is Iraq we're talking about. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of background on Iraq itself, giving, showing you a series of slides that I initially drafted to show my mom and my wife as I was proposing to start field work in the Republic of Iraq. So Iraq is a complicated place, as I'm sure most of you are aware. Um, it is uh, ethnically very diverse with uh, kind of Shia, uh, Shia Arabs in the south, Sunni in the, mostly in the kind of the north and the west, and then of course on the fringes of the Zagros you have, you have Kurds who are mostly Sunni but largely take their identity from their ethnicity as opposed to their religion. Um, in 1970, the government of Iraq declared unilaterally that there would be a Kurdistan autonomous region defined by these three northern provinces. And then the government began to push Kurds into this area um, out of other areas, especially oil rich areas that they were more interested in having Arabs in. Um, and this was the situation up until 1991 when uh, the uh, Iraqi army left the Kurdistan region and, and the Kurds sort of formed themselves into a kind of a de facto state within the state and sort of pushed their boundaries about to what you see here. And this was the situation up until about 2003 with the Kurds largely autonomous within this area. Which brings us to the humanitarian crisis of the second Gulf War, the American invasion of 2003, uh, which produced uh, about 109,000 deaths, according to U.S. government information that was leaked uh, via WikiLeaks. Um, information that all has very precise latitude and longitude attached to it, so if you're kind of a geography nerd like me, you can really vividly display this. These are points, but it's maybe a little bit easier to see. Here, this is a ratio of deaths per 100 square kilometers. Obviously, Baghdad, a very dangerous place, but also Mosul and Kirkuk and, and, and Basra. This is up to 2007, but then, after the, the surge, violence really was reduced. Still a very, very dangerous place, but far less violent than it had been before. And here's the slide for my, for my mom. Um, the Kurdistan region was almost completely outside of that. So this is the modern political context um, that started my own work and got authorization from mom and wife and, and, and Harvard lawyers. Um, <laughs> So there's also, uh, that's the kind of the modern geopolitical context. The, the intellectual context is that this is a radically understudied region of an otherwise very well surveyed part of the world. Um, Iraq is the home of some of the most foundational archaeological surveys in the world. The yellow um, areas that you see here in the south of Iraq are the surveys of Bob Adams, Robert McCormick Adams, and his, uh, his students and colleagues done largely in the 60s and the 70s. And these were foundational for the way we think of archaeological survey. Um, after in the, starting in the late 80s and into the 90s, there was another set of surveys done largely outside of Iraq, um, much more intense, smaller areas and more intensive. These were largely done by Wilkinson, Tony Wilkinson and his students, and, and, and I'm one of those. 
But you'll notice a very large gap in research in the north of Iraq, including that kind of core area of the Assyrian Empire, that Assyrian Triangle that I showed you before. So with the stability of the Kurdistan region falling in, um, which encompasses a large part of that, that imperial core, um, I proposed to do uh, a, a survey in the area around the, the Kurdish capital of Erbil starting in 2012. And they gave me an obscene kind of neo-colonial 3,200 square kilometer survey area. There's not very many places in the Middle East where an American can get that. Um, and since then, uh, almost all of Kurdistan is now under survey by uh, ar archaeologists. And so this rapidly is going to, it's going to fill in. So largely because of my, uh, largely because of, of Nico Tripsevic, I associate Berkeley and ARF with super high-end methodological work, especially geospatial work. So I'm going to spend some time talking about what we do in the field. Um, a little bit different from the way Nico operates, but um, you know, I'm, I'm trying. So our field methods are, I think, very important in how we approach a landscape of this vast scale. We're surveying an imperial core, and we have a large portion of it to survey. So we're heavily based on archaeological remote sensing. Um, when I talked, I've, I've often had colleagues come up to me saying, you know, Jason, I know you're into this remote sensing thing, but I got a satellite image and it didn't work. And of course, immediately that makes me say, well, like, when was it taken? Was it old? Is it new? Was it in the spring or the fall? I mean, there's, there's no one image. You can have a lovely image. This is the city of the Assyrian capital of Nimrud, one of the earlier capitals, showing the citadel and the city wall here, um, a little bit of a, an irrigation canal that fed the city. Um, but this is taken in August. This is really dry, and you can't see anything. But if you turn to March, which is a wetter time of year, you know, this is a, a, a color image from 2011, you can see a lot more of that canal. You can see some hints in this discoloration in these green areas. There's, there's more there. You can see more going on under these modern fields. But if you have both age and the right time of year. This is, a, this is an image from um, February of 1967. Not only can you see that entire irrigation, uh, that canal coming up to the city, but you can even see processional ways going through the fabric of the city. So this is an image that has historical depth and it has exactly the kind of right seasonality and moisture. So this is the sort of thing that we're trying to use a lot to be able to identify sites and features uh, in, in this area. So historical imagery has become really big. Modern imagery is great. It can show you uh, things that go beyond what the human eye can see, but it shows you the modern landscape. And even in an, in an underdeveloped place like Iraq, there's still a lot of development that has badly damaged landscapes in the, 20th, in the late 20th century. So I have made a lot of use out of declassified intelligence imagery, first from the, whoop, from the Corona program, which ran up until the month after I was born was the last flight. Um, more recently, this is available via the USGS on the Earth Explorer website to anybody. It's, it's a wonderful example of government openness, this declassification. Uh, more recently, the successor program called Hexagon was declassified. Um, unfortunately, we don't make film anymore. Apparently, we've moved to a post-film world. So the, U the National Archives didn't have enough film to give a copy to the USGS. For Hexagon, you have to go to a small room in College Park, Maryland to see this stuff. And I've stumbled upon the U-2 um, spy plane mission going all the way back to the 1950s. So we're making some use of this. This stuff is almost impossible to find without, um, uh, I found a, a very strange man who has completely hacked this system, came and found me, and I follow him into the National Archives, and I've been able to find some U-2 imagery here. But this hi historical imagery has been absolutely fantastic for finding archaeological sites and landscapes in this really vast region that we've proposed to, uh, to study. So here's an example of a, a walled Assyrian city. This is the modern, it, the modern name of this place is Qasr Shamamak. This was ancient Kilazu, and this was a provincial capital um, just to the west of, of, um, of Erbil, where you can see very clear citadel and wall. And that shows up both in this historical U2 imagery and the corona and the hexagon, and very clearly in the modern uh, commercial GOI image. But what you, uh, 
it doesn't take high resolution satellite imagery to find a 50 hectare walled Assyrian city. Um, however, look at this little bit down here, okay? That had never been recognized before. If I could pull out a little bit on this image, there are, there are dozens of small blobs like that within um, maybe three kilometers of this city that, that would otherwise be extremely difficult to find without very painstaking walking transects. So sitting in my air-conditioned office in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I identified about 1,600 archaeological sites, potential archaeological sites, using these historical sources in our uh, 3,200 square kilometer area here. And to give you some context here, um, this is the, uh, the capital of the Assyrian capital city of Nimrud. Here is Mosul and Nineveh. Here is Erbil. And this is this area that we're, we're surveying. So, 1,600 archaeological sites viewed from space. Now, obviously, not all of these are going to be Assyrian. We have to go, we have to, go to the ground to, to find them. The most famous archaeological site in this region is, of course, Erbil itself. It's a modern, thriving modern city, but it also was an important ancient city, very important in the Assyrian Empire. And uh, it may be a little bit hard to get a sense of scale, but that's about a 30-meter high mound. I think you can see this, this fringe around it. Um, the, it has continued to be occupied. This is probably what Mesopotamian mounded sites looked like at the time they were settled. Um, Erbil is uh, nearly unique in that it continues, has continued to have people living on top of it right up until the present. Uh, unfortunately, the, the modern city of Erbil, this is 1938, it now extends almost as far as you can, as you can see here. But um, a really a glorious archaeological site, unfortunately, under a modern town. More typical of archaeological sites in the area is this, uh, a, a small, maybe, maybe half hectare mound. And we know right where these are because we've identified them from the satellite imagery and we can go right to them. We're not doing transect walking. Uh, we are entirely digital, so um, until very recently, um, I had a very expensive Trimble GPS handheld computer running the ArcPad software for the um, geospatial nerds in the audience here. Um, this was OK. Um, it wasn't the, the greatest interface. When I would show my Kurdish colleagues this, they would try to tap the screen and pinch and zoom in and out. And of course, this is not something that you can do on Windows Mobile. We did this until uh, last season when we had some kind of revolutionary new uh, additions to our field kit. And this is something that I'd, I'd, I'd highlight in a, in a technologically savvy uh, audience. We've begun to use drones. And this has been revolutionary, um, not because we're the first people to use drones, probably we're about the last people to use drones. But it's become revolutionary because you no longer have to be a Niko Tripsevic to do this. You can be a kind of a thick-headed person like me and buy one off the shelf by download software and get a reasonable product without being um, kind of a, a technological uh, leader in this. It has become a tool that anybody can use. So it is now something that we use not just on the uh, odd interesting site, but we use it on every site at this point. So we have an interesting protocol. We, on day one, the drone team goes out to fly an archaeological site that we intend to collect. And there is now web-based planning software where you literally draw a polygon around it and the software will calculate the best trajectory to get the, the three-dimensional product that you want out of it. This is then something that we go to the field and fly. And in the first season, I did a little bit of flying myself because Let's be honest, this is really cool stuff. It's, it's fun to fly drones. But very quickly, I realized that this wasn't, um, this was something that I could train others to do, including Khalil, a Kurdish archaeologist in Erbil, who now does 100% of our flying. He is our drone team. Um, occasionally, we have take your son to work day, and, and his son Abd, uh, uh, Abdurrahman comes. Um, this is great. This, my drone doesn't come home. It lives in Erbil now. So when I'm there, it flies for our project. Um, but when I'm not, it becomes a tool that the uh, Department of Antiquities in Erbil runs for themselves. They can do all this stuff except the, except the processing. They send the, they send the images to me via Google Drive and I make the models and send it back. But they're now doing this for their own purposes. And, and this, is, uh, this has been one of the best things I've ever done was to put this kind of technology into the hands of my local collaborators. 
Um, that evening, we would take the image into processing software, and we're using Esri's drone to map. This takes the images and stitches them together into a really high resolution ortho photo, but also uh, terrain data, which we can then use to plan how are we going to approach the surface collection of these places. So here's a particularly complicated site with a, 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 a mound that was occupied over several centuries and some lower areas surrounding it and some isolated bits. In the past, this is the kind of thing where I would show up and having being the sole proprietor of the geospatial data on my Trimble unit, I would have to tell people where to go. Now we can plan this out the night before with the drone data, and then the next day we could go out to the field and collect it with great precision. And again, I no longer have to tell people, you know, your collection area is between that sheep carcass over there and that mud brick house. Now um, we can push this to, to the cloud and every single team member has 100% of our spatial data. They don't need to know to stop at the dead cow and not go any further. The, the, their GPS units and their mobile devices tell them. Um, and sometimes we can even give them the terrain that was captured two days prior. And this has made our collection so hyper efficient that we can, we can really uh, move at a speed that I think is starting to justify the Kurds allowing me to have 3,200 square kilometers of their cultural heritage. And that's something that kind of uh, I, I take very seriously. So ultimately what we're trying to do is something like this. We're trying to write site biographies uh, of, of individual settlements. Um, you know, here's an, here's an archaeological site that was occupied in eight different ceramic periods, starting in the late fifth millennium and continuing up to the Sasanian or late antique uh, period, um, and shifting its size and scale through time. This is what we want to know. We want to know how these places expanded and contracted through time. Um, but not just one of these places, like all of our, our places. And the drone imagery has also proven to be our best outreach tool to our local, um, our local Kurdish, um, well, the people that live in and around these archaeological sites. The ability to send this up to a, a sharing site like this is, you're looking at me interacting with Sketchfab here, um, has really been the best way that we could possibly reach out to um, our are kind of Kurdish stakeholders. Also, it's really just, I still just think this is really cool <laughs> to look at. So what have we found? Now, we're, we have about six or 7,000 years of sedentary uh, settlement in this area that I could tell you about, but I really, I'll focus on the Neo-Assyrian landscape because that's really what's been driving our work and especially driving this kind of question of of what is, the, what is the nature of this landscape? Is it really truly as engineered as, as, as we've hypothesized? So in our four, now four field seasons of, uh, of survey, let's make sure I get these numbers right. So we found 516 sites. We have about another thousand sites that we still need to visit before we're going to be finished. Um, we've collected about 55,000 pot sherds and typed about 13,000 of them. So we're beginning to get a good picture of how these sites were settled or abandoned through time. And we have about 87,000 photos out of, out of the drone. So we have an unbelievably, in, in my opinion, a staggeringly well uh, documented landscape so far, but we still have, have quite a, a bit left to do. Uh, the thing that I'm most excited about, the black dots that you see on this map are sites that we've collected, and the blue areas are the areas that we've flown with the drone. And this system has basically allowed us, at this point, to cover almost every single site. So we've always measured area, but I think we're getting to the point where a basic element of what we record about individual archaeological sites can be volume as well. And sites that are made out of mud brick and they go th grow upwards through time, volume is an important um, attribute uh, that says something about the duration of, of ancient settlements in, in this area. So we've certainly found that there are these large uh, planned uh, uh, capital cities. This was not really a surprise. This is a, 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 a terrain model of, of uh, Kilizu, Dur, uh, uh, Kasser Shamamak, um, showing that in great detail. This isn't something that we really needed to document. This was something that was, was known. I want to show this image just because it shows that these archaeological sites have had very interesting afterlives. In the case of, of Kasser Shamamak, at the time it was visited by Austin Henry Layard in the, I think in the 1840s, it had an Ottoman fort, and we see a little bit of that there. 
Um, it was an Iraqi post, uh, military post leading up to the first Gulf War. And there you can see the trenches that the Iraqi army dug around it. Um, American planes flew over that base in sometime in, at the beginning of the war. And there's some lovely craters that look like you're on the surface of the moon. Those are American munitions. And a French team has begun to excavate it. And there you have some nice trenches and some spoil, uh, spoil heaps. And that's before we get down to the citadel with a, a known palace somewhere in there of King Sennacherib and a very large lower town with a still preserved, very clear outer wall. But exactly the sort of thing that we were expecting to see big, in some cases, big urban planned areas. But overwhelmingly, what we see is just the opposite, small rural sites. In some cases, so small that they're in danger of being obscured by a herd of, uh, a herd of, of uh, goats and a surveyor. But they, this is very typical. This is probably about a quarter to a half hectare. It's only maybe a meter or two high. Um, it probably has one or two periods, one of which is Neo-Assyrian. And we find loads of these. At the scale of the region, this is what the core of the Assyrian Empire looked like uh, in the, between the 900 and 600 uh, BC, to be very coarse. Very, very full. Um, lots of small dots with, that's that, um, that Kilizu, um, uh, uh walled city that, that I just showed you. Um, lots of dots and a lot of them kind of far away from water, not on the, the perennial water sources, which is where people kind of like to live because pe people like, like water. Um, complicating this, uh, unlike the pattern that we'd seen elsewhere, was the fact that we've also discovered a late Bronze Age, a Middle Assyrian um, landscape that was already very full. So our idea that we would look at the Assyrian core and it would just explode at the time of the Neo-Assyrian Empire has been complicated by the fact that this was also the core of the Middle Assyrian state, which also turns out to have been um, pretty dense, although not nearly as divorced from water as what we see at the time of the uh, of, of the, um, the imperial height. I'm not going to go into this boring graphic in too much detail, but what you're seeing in the bars, the bars are a histogram of the numbers of sites through time from um, early, from, from kind of prehistoric up until Islamic period. Um, you'll notice one particular big spike right there. That's the number of sites at the time of the, the Neo-Assyrian Neo Empire. And you can see it's this massive explosion in the numbers of sites kind of followed very closely by the Late Bronze Age that, that preceded it. And these truly are mostly little, tiny, small sites. In other areas on the fringes of the empire, we saw very high densities in terms of sites per square kilometer, ranging from uh, 0.11 to 0.18. But the urbial plain is even greater than that, with um, about 0.22 in, in, our, in our latest measurement. And uniformly very small, at least as small as these other average sites in these other regions. So the core is overwhelmingly defined by uh, dense sites and very small, exactly as we would, we would expect to see. And then there's the, the intervention in the landscape. Uh, we found a series of extraordinarily big canals. You're seeing here a natural water course that's flowing through the plain. And then the drone video that you're looking at now is this giant canal that took off of it right here. For scale, there's a car, there's Khalil flying the drone, and you're looking at about a 100 meter wide, 8 to 10 meter deep, giant gash across this watershed. This is not something that was undertaken by local villagers looking to increase their water supply. This is the act of a, of a state redirecting this natural water course to flow like this and ending in this bizarre basin, um, about 300 meters uh, across. Um, we don't have good absolute dating on this feature yet, but the sites that are closest to it are uh, predominantly uh, of this Neo-Assyrian era. So big canals on the plain, but also some interesting small features as well. Uh, I'll show you two features that are to the north of Erbil. Uh, one is a, a subterranean channel that's been known for a long time, but new information has come to light. And then another is an area sort of along it that shows evidence for some smaller scale uh, irrigation at this time. So we'll go first to this area inter intermediately to it. On satellite imagery, we found a lot of very 
faint lines running like this. This is a natural drainage here. This is another natural drainage here. And a series of lines that suggesting small local uh, offtakes that are probably irrigating something like gardens, maybe vineyards, maybe, maybe orchards um, that are remarkably uh, reminiscent of features that are known elsewhere to the north of, of Nineveh, a place called Feda. Um, I got very excited when I saw this on the satellite imagery because they look just like this known place called Feda, which has reliefs on the side of it. So I got very excited that, that we were going to find reliefs here and I was going to, and finally my art historical colleagues would start to care about what I do for the first time <laughs> ever. Um, unfortunately, when we got there, it was not the right kind of terrain. It was far, it was sort of gravelly, but you can see here the, that canal kind of snaking its way across with the looming city of Erbil in the background. So I didn't get my reliefs and my art historian colleagues still don't care anything about what I do. Um, but nonetheless, uh, again, I don't have good dating evidence for this, except that it looks just like the Feda system, which is known to be uh, Assyrian. But then going further to the north, um, this was a very interesting discovery. I didn't think of the drone as being a prospecting tool, but here's a case where it turned out to be a tool for discovery and not just documentation. Uh, this is an area where uh, a tributary of the, of the Tigris was flowing, a place that had a known canal head. This is a photo of this feature in the side of the hill. Um, in, until 1991, there was a cuneiform inscription on the top of this little cut stone opening that mentioned that King Sennacherib had dug this, this tunnel to guide water to the city of Erbil. It was stolen in the aftermath of the, of the first Gulf War, but it had been copied. So we know that this is, a, this is the starting point to a subterranean channel that went about 23 kilometers to, to Erbil. Okay, but wh what hadn't been appreciated was how water was fed into that. We were interested to fly over this area to produce this, this lovely um, digital elevation model that you see here. First and foremost, because this is a threatened area, the city of Erbil is growing through cement, and cement comes from gravel, and gravel miners had dug this out, and they dug this out, and we were afraid they were going to take away this, this, this feature. Um, so we, we flew it, we got a digital elevation model, and then we got this ortho photo that you know, Khalil flew this when I wasn't there, but when we took it back and we produced the, the model, I saw this feature right here, and if we zoom in on that, this is, had been exposed by um, some rainfall earlier in the season, and I think if you squint, you can see that these stones, they have an awfully, a suspiciously straight line up there. The, the, uh, the downslope the down uh, or downstream edge is very clear, a bit of damage from the mining on the upslope side, and if you if you follow that, that line right there, there we follow it, you can see that it goes, it would go straight to the opening of that canal head. So there was a dam here. I don't know if it was a, to impound water or simply just to redirect it, but this is 20 meters wide. This is about the width, this is maybe a little bit wider than this room is long. This is massive and we have it for probably about 500 meters. It continues in this direction. This is exactly the kind of large-scale landscape transformation that, that we were kind of hypothesizing that we would see, um, in this case, to feed, um, to feed water to the, 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 the provincial capital at Erbil. So my uh, colleagues in, uh, now I will say that for me, this lovely dash line is more than enough to demonstrate this. My Kurdish colleagues um, wanted to see more. They trust me now, but first they had to bring in a backhoe and expose that bloody thing. So we now know that it in fact does what that dashed line does, thanks to um, my uh, collaborator um, Nader Babakur in Erbil, who saw to it that that thing was, was excavated. I'm not sure what's going to happen to it next, but we do have confirmation that in fact that at least the, sub, the subterranean elements of that dam um, do in fact extend all the way uh, there. So let me give you some kind of half half-baked conclusions. Uh, despite the fact that we've had four seasons already, I feel like this work is real, kind of, we're still just underway. But I can say that so far we're finding um, largely what we expected to find. We're finding a, a kind of a, a very full landscape in a, in a way that we feel is, is non-natural. Uh, lots of small sites far away from water. At the same time, we're finding uh, a transformation of the hydrological landscape in the form of irrigation uh, systems, uh, water diversion, 
and certainly the, the, the large capital cities. It's complicated by the fact that there was a pre-existing very full landscape and we're in the process of trying to pull those apart to see to what extent um, really this was, this was planning. Um, but I found myself kind of trying to get out of the mentality of this, this top-down approach, which you know, satellite images don't help if you're trying to get out of a top-down <laughs> approach. Um, and I'm trying to think about, I'm starting, I wanted to know more about this guy. Uh, we're finding all these small sites that are being trod upon by um, goats. And I think the next step is to try to figure out what were these people's lives like. And this is where landscape archaeology starts to fail us. This is going to take excavation. And, and so I, I, when I talk about this, I always throw this out there in hopes that somebody will say, yeah, I'd like to do that because I shouldn't be allowed near a trowel. This is not what I do, and archaeological sites should be protected from me. I'm, I'm a survey person. But this is really something that we can't do if we really want to understand what the lives of these people were like as they lived in, possibly were forcibly deposited in this core part of, of the uh, Assyrian uh, Empire. Uh, one thing that we can say is they don't seem to have stayed there very long. Now, these deportations, they took place over generations. But by the time we get our next good ceramic glimpse of what that landscape looks like, it had been transformed. A lot of those small sites were no longer occupied. People had pulled up and gone somewhere else. Did they go back to Anatolia, Israel, the Zagros? Well, this we don't know. I mean, uh, you could suppose that maybe some of these deportees retain some memory of where their parents or their grandparents or their ancestors came from and felt like with the collapse of political power they should go back to those places. This, I don't, this, this we can't say, but we can say that by the time we have the good vivid picture in the Hellenistic period, uh, it's a really radically different landscape. It has it, other interesting characteristics, but it doesn't, seem to, it, it doesn't seem to be completely connected to what we saw at the, uh, at the height of, of Assyria. So this continues to be a place where you can work. It is challenging. Um, it occasionally is, makes your life interesting. Um, we lost two seasons thanks to ISIS when, when um, the ISIS militants left um, Mosul in 2014 and came and began an attack on Erbil. They got as far as a place called Gwer there and a place called Mahmur there before they were, um, before the Americans started to um, bring in uh, airstrikes. Um, to give you a sense of where my, uh, where my contracts, the, the Kurds have given me the uh, permission to survey within this area, that was really, really close. Um, so we took a couple of seasons off, but that has long since retreated. Um, we now work firmly within the, uh, the security zone of the city of, of Erbil. I don't even have to pull out my passport anymore as I go from the city out into this countryside to do survey. A bigger issue that we're faced with as we try to move forward with this project is development. Um, Erbil being one of the safest in, uh, parts of the Middle East right now, certainly of Syria and Iraq, has gone from a little, the tell with a, with a town around it in 19, this is I think 1967. Um, this is a, uh, this is a, a, a Sentinel-2 image from last, last March. Um, you can see that what was right here, and this is to the same scale, the ring roads keep going further and further out, so we feel like we're in a race against time. That's why these remote sensing techniques and uh, drone-based recording, really, we need this help to move more quickly. And fortunately, we're not doing it. The days of the foreigners showing up for a few weeks and doing a bit of this and then retreating back to their universities uh, are, I think, they're over in this area. We have a particularly strong, we've trained a particularly strong bunch of local archaeologists who um, do the flying and are beginning to do some of the mapping and collection work uh, as well. It may be uh, a time when this is a year-round survey project and, and, and I come in just when the university will, will, will let me go. Um, so I am cautiously uh, optimistic. <coughs> Um, uh, we have a fantastic multinational um, uh, survey team with Americans and French and, and Dutch and Italians and Brits. Um, and we'll continue to do this work with our, uh, with our, uh, our Iraqi uh, Kurdish colleagues. 
Um, I'll end just by thanking the, the Kurdistan regional government, especially its representation in Washington, D.C., which is very interested to have uh, American teams working in this region. Um, NSF, Nat Geo, and Dumbarton Oaks have been um, wonderful funders that I, most, I very much appreciate. And after what I understand has been a very long day for many of you of sitting in rooms listening to people talk, thanks all to you for coming and listening to yet one more talk. Mm -hmm. I'm take willing to take a few questions. I want to as, say, if he is, you can ask a few questions, and then we can all retire, please, to the um, atrium where you can talk with him individually and have a little um, treat. Does, <laughs> does, does anybody ever say no, no questions, and drop the mic and walk straight out? <laughs> Uh, I will now entertain your questions. <laughs> Is that formal enough? <laughs> uh, you first and, and then, yeah, please. Uh, can you compare your work with what's been going on in Guatemala with LIDAR, LIDAR, whatever it is, around the call, expanding the site? Yeah. This has been some of the most exciting work, especially on urban landscapes, where new developments in LIDAR have allowed landscape archaeologists like me working in tropical environments where you have canopy to strip all that vegetation off and see what's underneath it. And, and these Mesoamerican, these lowland Mesoamerican cities have gone from plausibly being interpreted as vacant ritual centers to being revealed to be um, unbelievably dense, um, very heavily populated uh, urban places. So I, I, I particularly like this because of my kind of bottom-up leanings to see that, yes, oh, there were actual people there that actually did things like terrace their landscapes and build houses and stuff like that. If you saw some ground photographs, you'll realize that um, vegetation canopy is not an issue for me. <laughs> so I have not begun to explore vege uh, vegetation, but I'm very interested in, 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 in this work. Thanks. Please. Yes. Some of them, or can you tell us, some of them had disappeared during the Neo-Assyrian period because yeah. we know that they talk about moving these deportees around to different areas that they were in control of. Yeah. We are, with surface material, for dating criteria, we're wholly dependent on surface artifacts and association of those artifacts with the site. And unfortunately, a lot of the, the forms, the ceramic forms that we use are extremely durable. And in fact, we know that some of the types that we call Neo-Assyrian actually extended into what would the politically be the Neo-Babylonian period, a time after the collapse of, of the empire. So no, we can't tell. And in fact, it's, it's possible that um, the, the ultimate dissolution of this Assyrian imperial landscape wasn't with the dissolution of political power in Assyria, it could have been later. But that makes for much less interesting of a, much more messy of a narrative, so I wait for somebody to ask a, a question in the Q&A to, to, to admit to that. What, what I'd really like to know is whether we can see any evidence in these ceramic collections for the arrival of people who might still be adhering to uh, ceramic manufacturing traditions from their homelands. You know, is there Anatolian pottery at this site, Anatolian Iron Age pottery at this site or something like that. And here's where I'm hoping that at a later stage we can revisit these collections. Right now I'm doing the processing and I don't know, I don't know Levantine pottery, I don't know, I wouldn't see this. But I'm hoping that when we can have a proper study season I can bring in Iron Age specialists from a much larger part of the empire who can address that question. Please. Yeah, I think um, Tony Wilkinson, who I think was your mentor um, up in Syria, was, um, I think he was pre-LIDAR, but he was definitely using satellite imagery, mm. and was really interested in pathways between settlements, yeah. um, going across, you know, the network of pathways across which would sort of help with your idea of, um, you know, artificial versus natural yeah. So um, I am uh, I'm sort of a technologically savvy version of 
Tony Wilkinson. Um, Tony, uh, I, was, I was relaying the story earlier today. Tony was the one who discovered the declassification of these intelligence images. And when he introduced them to me, he had, he had bought, a, he had bought a, a photographic positive and he was, put, he was shining a light on it up against the wall of his office and he taped a piece of paper to the wall and he was penciling out what he saw. Sweet. And he, he said to me and a bunch of his other students, why don't you do something with GIS with this? So he gets full credit for discovering this source. And a lot of my, my dissertation research was, it was tracing exactly these, these roadways, which are overwhelmingly early Bronze Age. In, uh, and I was, I'm really disappointed to say that the lovely patterns that I found in northeastern Syria with these trackways seem to have been obliterated in the core of the Assyrian Empire, I think by the Assyrian emphasis on irrigation. I think that in the northeastern parts of Syria where these, these Bronze Age road networks uh, are really clear on the satellite image, they survived because the Assyrians never did this level of intensive irrigation that they did in the core. So what we're seeing, when, when I see no trackways whatsoever, I think it's because they were probably there, but they were just wiped clean in the Iron Age by, by a, a very top-down, water-intensive form of, of, of uh, land use. So I looked. Yeah, you, you know, uh, one thing I have to bear in mind when I, when I curse modern development for wiping clean some of my landscape features, I have to realize and I, I have to kind of remind myself, wiping clean of landscape features is not something that's unique to the 21st century. I mean, the, the, the Iron Age, the Assyrians were wiping clean the Bronze Age landscape and the Bronze Age people removed uh, any sign of um, kind of early uh, you know, mobile people that you might be interested to study. So it's, it's, a, it's a long process. You had a question. Yeah, I just had a quick question about your text factory. Uh, you said you were doing photogrammetry. Are you mm -hmm. using something like Agisoft, or is that coming with the drone software that you're having? Yeah, the, what, what software am I using? I started off using the Agisoft PhotoScan, <laughs> which is fantastic um, software and affordable, I have to say. It's a $500 license, and it was great. But what I found was the ESRI drone to map being, being intended for geographic scale work. I mean, you can use the Agisoft software to model a landscape, but really you can use it on objects so as ESRI well. So ESRI drone to map does the actual photography? It, it, does the, it does the stitching and the production of the ortho photo and the production of a model. Um, a lot. <laughs> yes, uh, it's, it's built on the PIX4D engine if you've done anything with PIX4D. So it has the same requirements. Um, uh, it's the kind of thing that you run overnight. Yeah. If you have a nice computer, if you don't have a nice computer, you run it over a weekend. <laughs> um, but the output is, 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 is fantastic. I bought, um, I bought for, for the, for the f in the field, I bought a, um, a gamer's computer. This is a world that I don't live in because I needed to you know, get a job and get tenure, so I, I don't know the gamer world. But I came to realize that these computers that are designed for playing, you know, for shooting each other in a virtual environment in these games, fantastic for this kind of processing. So I bought one of those and that allowed. You actually do it on a laptop. I did it on a laptop, yeah. So the, the nice thing about the drone to map software is it's intuitively landscape oriented. And also, it, it has a great facility for batching. So I could run three models and then go to bed. And then the next morning, they, three would have run sequentially. So I'm, I'm a fan. It's not cheap, but it's, um, but it's, it's useful. Thank you. Sure. Please. Um, so finding these canals, these waterways, uh, have any of them, have you ever been able to follow any of these water sources? Because they eventually lead to somewhere. How, how how successful have you been in finding newer, uh, you know, the areas that have never been discovered before by just you know, following the path of water? Yeah. The, the, the problem is one of, of survival. It's, it's a taphonomic issue. We can find the big ones. With the exception of that lovely set of um, small, possibly orchard irrigating features, for the most part, we find the one that I showed you that video of, the ones that are 100 meters wide and eight meters deep that survive. Now, those things fed um, you know, distributaries and fields, but that's been wiped clean. That's, that hasn't survived. So here's where, in a fantasy, I have a team of, of um, geophysicists who come out and they find this stuff under the ground. But they seem to have largely been, it, it, the surface remains seem to have been wiped clean. 
So this makes me a little bit uncomfortable because we're left with only the top-down part. We're left with the signature of what the state did. It's entirely possible that the state just built this backbone and then uh, local decision makers about water were doing interesting stuff that might kind of make us think twice about a real top-down landscape. It would kind of move more towards the middle of that continuum. And then local people took over. Yeah. You know, that, I, that's the kind of thing that I strongly suspect, but the, it's, that, it's that emergent end of the continuum that's least, vigor, at least likely to survive. And so we're left with the skeleton that looks really top down. So I'm, I worry about this. <laughs> yeah, please. Can I add, build on that, please? Mm -hmm. um, Link to uh, the lack of visibility of smaller canals. Mm -hmm. Would not your settlement pattern in the Neos here, and kept, you made a point about them being off the waterways, they've got to be on some waterways. Yeah. So could they not be on man-made waterways? So could they yeah. not be where these not, no longer overtly visible canals would be, and you could even use that as a way to test yeah. space around those sites? In fact, building on my, the, my geophysics fantasy here, I have thought about, you know, since they, some of them potentially, if you squint, they line up. What about doing some transects, some geophysical transects across there? What, what I do know is I have stared intensely at these areas trying to find some of these, the dark lines that we interpret as the remains of, of, of canals, and I can't find them in this area, but it may be a case where sort of some targeted geophysics could do this. I'm not certain, I'm, I'm not a geophysicist. Um, I'm an admirer of geophysics, and I don't know if this sort of thing is done, but it seems like it would be really, it would allow, it would allow your hypothesis of of a, of a water system behind these, these kind of high and dry uh, sites to, to be tested, and I would love to do that. Yeah. Okay. So I can see that you don't have vegetation canopy today, but um, what about in the past? Do you have, mm. I mean, irrigation, presumably, you no. Know, um, uh, I guess my question is what kind of human impact on the environment um, yeah. do you see with um, any data? Yeah, so this is, this is a, a, another sort of, w w the, the data set that I have right now is really strongly oriented towards the settlements and the surface artifacts and it hasn't gotten into these kind of, um, kind of, in, kind of environmental questions that, that we, we need to ask in order to answer that sort of, of, of question. So um, I, the, the question of what was the, whether, whether there were, wh wh whether vegetation was different, we really, would ne we need some people to excavate some of these sites to look at charcoal remains to see if, what kind of fuel was being used, was there wood in the area? Um, I, I, I mean, certainly there are very, very few trees today, but you know, it's been 2,000 years, or 3,000 years since the Assyrians, and, but even before them, the, the plain had long since been settled and, and even urbanized. So the question of when, when that transition might have ha happened, do we blame the Assyrians? Certainly, the settlement patterns suggest that they they could take some blame, but it could have been could much much earlier. Um, my pleas towards you know excavate some of these small sites has this is a real challenge. I mean, in order to really understand this this landscape, we have to come down from low Earth orbit and start putting holes in some of these sites to test this sort of thing. But it's tr historically been really hard to get rural sites in this area excavated. So. Um, you can get permission to dig uh, a site like, uh, like Nineveh. The Iraqis are really happy for you to do that. Um, they're not so happy about you kind of wasting your energy on excavating a small village site that no tourist is ever going to want to come to see. So they will encourage you to dig these big sites, which is frustrating for me because that would help me answer your question. We don't have that data. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you find any roadways, hollowways, or anything like that? Well, uh, so th this is related to the question that, that Ruth asked, and, and I can tell you, <laughs> I don't have a good image here. There are a few that connect very closely to gates in the Assyrian capital cities. I don't have any good ones attached to any of the provincial places like, like uh, uh, Erbil, but I can show you lovely systems that radiate on gates that you've excavated uh, at the, the, on the southern end of, um, of, of Nineveh, and especially at Nimrud. Um, but they're so few compared to the network of the Bronze Age, the early Bronze Age especially, that we see in parts, adjacent parts of northeastern Syria. It really seems to have not been, I think it's related to land use. 
if you're intensively cultivating in a, in a dry farming way, they're more likely, I think, to be etched into the ground than under the Assyrian regime. Something that needs to be tested. So what I really would like to have done is to see nice Assyrian processional ways that we know from texts going out of these, uh, out of these uh, gateways and into the countryside. And that's, that's something that will require um, a, a more peaceful uh, Iraq to, to really test. Um, do I have time for mm, one more? One more? And it's you. This better be good. <laughs> prescribed to a site given on its rural or urban location? And maybe does anything stand out as um, going against those general places? Yeah. So that's precisely, that's, I think that's precisely the question to ask with the, this new ability to produce accurate volumetric estimates. Um, you know, we know, this, this is probably, there, there's probably the need for a good ethnoarchaeological study done first to see the lifespan of mud brick architecture and, um, oh. you know, develop a model for uh, how um, a site will grow through time with certain assumptions about um, wall thickness and um, survival rates. And, and then we could come up with a model for you know, dividing up, well, I'm thinking out loud here, so I'm going to say something dumb, but um, we'd have to kind of have ideas about, about space between you know, density of architecture within settlements and stuff like that. But this would be great. Are you looking for a dissertation? <laughs> Okay, uh, that would be great because it would really show, especially some of these small ephemeral Neo-Syrian sites, it might suggest whether it had been there for two centuries, three centuries of, of, of Syrian life or if it were deportees that stayed there until, they, until the political power was no longer in place to keep them there. And that would be, uh, if, if we see a lot of, you know, I showed you the, the, the small hectare the, the horizontal area measurement, if I could attach that to a small volume measurement as well, I think that would be an even more powerful argument for the ephemerality of, of this rural landscape. But um, it's, ask me in a few years. Okay, that was a good, that was a good question to end with. So uh, thank you. Thank you.